Our sermon text today is found in 1 Timothy, the 6th chapter, beginning in verse 9. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. As for those who in the present age are rich, command them not to be haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of the life that is really life. The Word of God for the people of God. Amen. This is the second week uh, in our Stewardship Sermon Series. Uh, our sermons are about how money speaks. Speaks of what we care about, what we want to invest our lives in. The insert today, and I hope there was one in your bulletin, uh, is a wonderful way of showing you uh, uh, where you might be uh, in your own giving. And I don't mind telling you, it's in hopes that you might consider taking the next step uh, when we turn in our commitment cards on October 28th. Even small steps matter uh, for the life and mission of our church here together. I have to give credit, uh, Allie Young and Ruthie Fahey uh, put a lot of these numbers together and Kelly Cerise made it pretty. And uh, we, we came out with a nice uh, uh, insert that tells us something about our giving here as a church family. My dad grew up during the Great Depression in a family of 11 children. Nine boys and two girls, including the twins, Sadie and Grady. They lived out in the country near Hammond in a little community known as Pumpkin Center. The kids all went to Ponchatoula High School in the summer without air conditioning so they could be out in the spring to pick strawberries, which was the only way the family could make a living in that time. Coca-Cola's cost a nickel back then. I understand it was a big bottle for a nickel. My dad was not able to buy one until he left home to join the Navy many years at, at the age of 17 because even a nickel could not be spared in that economy. My dad made a good living while I was growing up in Hammond. In fact, he died my senior year in high school. Our cars were paid for. Um, we had money in savings, and he left life insurance for my mom. My dad never had a credit card. He paid cash for all of his cars. And I did not need shoes unless he had money in his wallet to buy them. My dad made his living, ironically enough, in the finance business. And I remember him asking him one day, I said, Dad, you do this for a living. Why don't you ever borrow any money? He looked at me kind of funny and then said quite succinctly, I might add, Ken, the only people who should borrow money are people who have money because they're the only people who can pay it back. As I see it, I don't have any money, so I can't borrow any. But I will assure you this, if I ever get any money, I plan to borrow something. <laughs> In our scripture, this book enough, Adam Hamilton talks about what he calls credititis, the opportunity to buy now and pay later. Credit cards are easy to come by, aren't they? And Americans are apparently going deeper and deeper in debt in order to have what we want now so we can pay for it later. You've all seen the ad, there are some things money can't buy, but for everything else, there's MasterCard. The average credit card debt in this country is apparently around $17,000. But since many people pay off their credit cards at the end of every month, those who run balances on their cards, that, that amount will be higher than $17,000. It becomes a kind of slavery for many, and it's a prison that is hard to exit. As I thought about my sermon this week, I decided that the opposite of rich in our culture is not poor. The opposite of rich is free, and freedom is a valuable thing. I did youth ministry here at this church uh, in the 70s 
70, 70s and 80s uh, for 13 years. And I took youth from here uh, on some of the summers to the Appalachian Service Project uh, in the coal mining region of the country. We went, we went to places like Grundy, Virginia, and Possum Holler in Tennessee. Uh, we slept on the floors, took cold showers, and uh, worked uh, from early in the morning till dinner time, repairing and rebuilding homes for people in poverty in that coal mining region. There was a teenage boy from this church uh, uh, from Southeast Asia who went with us on a couple of those trips. His family was part of a group then known as the Boat People. Some, some of you will remember that because they had managed to flee their countries in Southeast Asia by getting on boats uh, and uh, uh, fre fleeing hostile regimes in their homelands. At University Methodist, uh, I, I was proud at the time, we adopted those families. And we had, this family, we adopted, we provided an apartment and food and housing, got the dad a job uh, as a custodian on campus. It was to be until they got their feet under them. And interestingly enough, uh, uh, he was very industrious. Within a year or two, uh, he had bought himself a car, found a better job in Lafayette, and packed up his family and moved. I, I still remember they were Buddhists, but the dad came to church on their last Sunday here and handed me a thank you card. The boy's last name was Santa Juan, but none of us could even begin to spell or pronounce his first name. It was a long first name. And so we asked him what he wanted to be called, and he was known as Ayers. Ayers' survival techniques were impressive. One day while he and I were working near each other on a house in the mountains of Virginia, I watched with fascination as Ayers caught a dragonfly, took a small piece of thread and quickly tied a little uh, loop around the dragonfly's neck, uh, tied it to a sawhorse near where he was working, tethered it so that as he worked, the dragonfly circled around him. I was intrigued, and so I walked over and said, hey, here, uh, sit down here a minute and tell me. Tell me about your life. Tell me how you got here. Well, he shared with me an incredible story. An incredible story of being awakened by his family in the middle of the night, of leaving all of his belongings and his little pet dog behind, of running through the jungle to get on a boat uh, to escape the military. He said that it was all scary because, as he put it, those people will kill anything, they will kill anybody. I asked him why he had chosen the name Ayer, A-I-R, why he had chosen the name Ayer as his church name. He smiled and took a small pocket knife out of his pocket and snipped that thread uh, that tethered the dragonfly, and then he said, he is free. Continuing to smile, he said, I want him to be called Ayer because the air is free. I am free now. I am happy now because I am free. In our text from 1 Timothy, Timothy, the apostle, says that the love of money is the root of all evil. This verse is often misquoted uh, to say that money is the root of all evil. It's not money. It is love of money that is said to be the problem. And the distinction matters. The writer immediately adds that in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves, he says, with many pains. When compared to people throughout the world, most of us, even though many of us would not consider ourselves to be rich, are blessed when it comes to the quality of life we have, the material possessions we have. There's a little warning in 1 Timothy. As for those who in the present age are rich, command them not to be haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God. Paul is saying that Christians must not become prideful because of their worldly wealth. He's pointing out that there is a liability to having much in the way of material possessions. And one of those liabilities is that we become too proud. The writer of Proverbs said at one point, Lord, don't give me too much so that I don't turn and say, who is the Lord? In other words, if he has 
has too much, he is likely to forget that he needs God at all. In our text today, the apostle goes on to say, they are to do good, to be rich in good deeds, liberal and generous and laying, thus laying up for themselves a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of life, which is indeed life. As Christians, we are free. We're free to do good. We are free to love others, to be generous with all that we have been given, with all that we have been blessed with. In the midst of the Protestant Reformation, the great reformer Martin Luther wrote an open letter to Pope Leo, summarizing his, Luther's own understanding of the gospel of grace and faith. It was accompanied by a brilliant treatise on Christian liberty, entitled, interestingly enough, The Freedom of a Christian. Luther was courageous. Luther was bullheaded. In fact, he wrote to the Pope as if they were somehow equals. And he put forth two powerful propositions at the very beginning of that treatise on Christian liberty. Two propositions concerning freedom and the bondage of the Spirit. First, he said, a Christian is a perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none. A Christian is a perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none. But then quickly added, added, a Christian is a perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to all. Luther texted the Apostle Paul from 1 Corinthians 9, 19, for though I am free, from all people, I have made myself a slave to all. And from Romans 13, 8, Owe no one anything except to love one another. I love the way the Apostle sums up what he's been saying in today's text about how we should handle the gifts that you and I have been given. They are to do good, he says, to be rich in good works, generous, ready to share, thus storing up for themselves treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of the life that really is life. So that they may take hold of the life that really is life. Wow, what an interesting statement. In the experience of life, acts of sacrifice can appear to you to be the limit of lives. You know, how can we actually say that to really find fulfillment in life, to to really get what we want and need out of life, that we can somehow find that through self-giving. And you know, for this, I found myself turning to the insights of a theologian, Paul Tillich. Tillich was clear that faith is the integrating factor for all of human life. People can choose to orient their lives, he said, around a variety of concerns. In fact, Tillich said one time, there are no atheists. There are no atheists. You just have to decide what you're going to worship. We can worship wealth. We can worship social status, politics, religious institutions. We can worship God. Some of the concerns are ultimate, while some are temporary. They disintegrate and destroy. Tillich, like Paul, is quick to claim that wealth and politics are unreliable objects. For they are fleeing, and they provide little hope for you and me in the face of death. In contrast, generosity and good works affirm real life because they arise from faith in the only. They arise from faith and trust in God. And such generosity <laughs> becomes real life because it's based on faith in the eternality of life. By God, life is given. By God, life is being given. By God, life will be given. With this understanding, you and I can make an active and courageous choice to affirm not only our own existence, the lives of those around us. We can take hold of life that is really life. We can be free. We can be perfectly free, subject to none. We can be a 
perfectly beautiful sermon of all. Subject to all.